you here tonight for our conversation on Super Tuesday, Super Tuesday fallout, are we there yet? And I have to say that um, we're a few minutes delayed in part because the conversation in the back room was so engrossing and illuminating. So I know you're in for a treat tonight. And I should say that, of course, many of you probably know that uh, one of the latest bits of information off the trail today is that Ben Carson um, admitted that he doesn't see a pathway forward for his campaign. So everybody's sort of parsing what that statement means about his future plans and um, whether he'll actually bring a formal halt to his campaign. But it's also a question I think all of us are asking today after Super Tuesday, just less than 24 hours after the results, what's the pathway forward for all the candidates on both sides of this race? What's the pathway forward for the parties and the coalitions that have actually formed the base of these parties um, in recent decades. So we'll get into all of that tonight and get your questions as well. I want to say a special thanks to our partners tonight, including Seminary Co-op Bookstore. They are selling copies of McKay Coppin's latest book. It's called The Wilderness, Deep Inside the Republican Party's Combative, Contentious, Chaotic Quest to Take Back the White House. Quite relevant. Um, we also uh, want to thank our partners at um, the Center for Policy Entrepreneurship at the Harris School. They've been very, very helpful and partnered in bringing Randy Brinson to campus, who will join us for the conversation as well today. Um, our conversation is on the record. Um, it's part of our ongoing series of uh, events that we do throughout the academic year. Uh, I've said this to you before if you've been here, but we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter if you're not on it already, and you'll get sent to your inbox every Monday a list of all the programs upcoming in our calendar. You can do that by going to our website at politics.uchicago.edu. Um, we'll be back to take questions from you a little bit later on. Uh, when we do, I'll come back to the microphone. We'll bring a roving mic around to those of you who have questions. We just simply ask that you keep your question short and to the point and make sure it is a question so that we can get to as many of you as possible. So with that, let me introduce Henry Hahn to get our program officially started. Henry is a second year here at the college. He's a math major and spent the summer in Iowa working for the Des Moines Register as an Iowa Project Fellow through the IOP. Um, he's been very involved in journalism, broadly speaking, and is working as an intern for us on our communications team. So please join me in welcoming Henry Hahn to the podium. Henry. Good evening, everyone. In a presidential election cycle, where perhaps the only word uttered more frequently on Sunday morning talk shows by Republican candidates than winning is winnowing, it goes without saying that the buildup to last night's delegate allocation milestone was immense. But if you're anything like me, you probably woke up this morning feeling more confounded and befuddled by the state of this race than you were the day before. For instance, you might be wondering, is Bernie Sanders now down and out in his fight against Hillary Clinton? Or is Ted Cruz now officially the only viable Republican alternative to Donald Trump? Does Marco Rubio still have a shot at winning the nomination? And what exactly are John Kasich and Ben Carson still doing in this race anyhow? Here to address all that and more, we are grateful to be joined this evening by a panel of experts. Tom Bevan is the co-founder of Real Clear Politics, a website whose polling average is commonly cited as an industry standard by journalists and politicians alike. Mr. Bevan also provides commentary and analysis through his own, uh, his own site, and he hosts radio shows on politics on both WLS 89 Chicago and Sirius XM's POTUS channel. Randy Brinson is a political activist and founder of Redeem the Vote, a nonprofit organization that seeks to improve voter registration and participation among young people of faith. McKay Coppins is a senior political writer at BuzzFeed News, and as Steve also mentioned, the author of a recently published book called The Wilderness, which details the feuds both inside and out of the Republican Party in its quest to take back the White House in 2016. And lastly, we are joined by Patty Solis Doyle, a current IOP fellow who served as a former aide to Hillary Clinton, a senior advisor to the presidential campaign of Barack Obama in 2008, and who currently serves as a political commentator for CNN. So please join me in welcoming our panel. OK, thank you. Um, Steve was right. The conversation in the green room was <coughs> unbelievable. So we're bringing it out here. Um, and I think I'm going to start with my far left uh, with Not McKay. Not politically. <laughs> no. That's where I'm sitting. Straight down the middle. Straight. Um, so I found last night 
immensely fascinating, and mostly on the Republican side, and mostly because of Donald Trump. McKay, he had a pretty good night last night. He won seven states. Uh, they were a geographically diverse state. He ran Massachusetts and Vermont, and he won Arkansas and mm. Georgia and Alabama. Um, and my question is, and I want everyone's perspective on this, is Donald Trump stoppable uh, <clears throat> in getting the nomination? And if he is, at what cost? I mean, we're reading all of these, this, the party yeah. uproar. <clears throat> Can they stop him, but at what cost? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the, the, if you were, if you were a, an establishment Republican or an ideological conservative uh, who is terrified at the prospect of Donald Trump winning the nomination, uh, last night was a, a very bad night for you, but you, if you were looking for glimmers of hope, you could find them, and I think that's at the stage we've reached at this race. There are a lot of people in the party who are so desperate for suck to find some you know, possibility that Trump won't win the nomination, that they'll cling to anything they can find. Um, I mean, look, Trump was projected by a lot of people to win 10 out of the 11 states. He won seven. Uh, in some of the states, he performed lower than, uh, actually, in almost, in most of the states, he performed lower than expected. Uh, he did not, a, a lot of people thought that after South Carolina and Nevada, he was going to start hitting 50%. Uh, in all these states, that has that didn't happen anywhere except maybe Massachusetts. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. Mm -hmm. um, so there, are, so there, I think there is a good case to be made that a huge chunk of this party, if not a slight majority of this party, is absolutely opposed to the idea of Donald Trump becoming the, the, the nominee. So that gives you an idea that he could be stoppable, but at what cost is the real question? I right. mean. You're, the, the ideas we're hearing get thrown around now <laughs> are just so out there and far-fetched and unprecedented that they, somebody on Twitter said that they sound like a bad episode of The West Wing. Um, I, I mean, the, you know, the idea that Cruz and Rubio should right now come together and say that they're going to be the ticket, uh, you know, whether it's Cruz as, as the nominee and Rubio as the running mate or the other way around. Uh, there is talk of trying to draft Mitt Romney from the convention floor. There is talk of uh, staging a convention coup. Uh, I, I, I mean, look, if you do, if if Donald Trump gets to the convention with <coughs> as the as the winner of this primary, and the Republican Party <coughs> finds some way to steal the nomination from him, the the. Uh, kind of uproar from the Trump wing of the party is going to be unlike anything we've seen in, in the modern politics and in the Republican Party. That said, when we were talking about this in the right. green room, there are a lot of people in this party who have already resigned themselves to losing the general election, and it's not about winning the general anymore. It's about saving the soul of the party. Now, I'm not saying that's most of the people in the party. There are a lot of people talking that way, though. All right, well, that's what that we were talking about this in the room, and, and I want to go to Randy on this one. So, Donald Trump is doing remarkably well. Like, we're all, our jaws are like, mm -hmm. what? Um, mm -hmm. And part of the reason is because he's getting a good share of the evangelical vote. Mm -hmm. So, I, which I'm fascinated by. Obviously, this is a man twice divorced. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, there are so many reasons why he shouldn't be getting <laughs> much, the evangelical much worse vote. even than twice divorced. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, and we were talking about it in the room. I'm going to let you talk about it. But <laughs> why is he getting the evangelical vote? And the same question goes to you. At what cost can the, the establishment of the party actually stop him from getting the nomination? Well, Patty, I appreciate you having that question. It actually is about a four-hour answer. All right, can you just... I will, try to, I will try to make five it down minutes. a little five-minute thing. <laughs> first, first of all, this is, a very, as you mentioned, is very unprecedented. One of the things I was talking to people about the pollsters, though, the polling is very different about evangelicals from 2004 to 2008, 2012 to 2009. There's been a tremendous change in what is called evangelical. Now, imagine if I asked people in this room, what, what's your definition of evangelical? You'd get probably 100 different answers or 10 different answers. Traditionally, evangelical, if you look up in Webster, it means a messenger, okay? It means to message to people. And it typically applies to Christians that are very strongly devout Christians that they want to share that message of Christ with others. 
such as Billy Graham and these type of people. That's the traditional thing of evangelicals. However, when pollsters say that to someone and you ask someone, are you evangelical? In the South, it's so cliche to say that, that people may go to church instead of every week. Maybe someone goes once a month, what we call CEOs, Christmas, Easter only, and they say they're evangelical. So that's something you have to parse through. And if you look at some of the data from South Carolina, the ones that went, the ones, most of the ones that went to, went, that said they were evangelicals but voted for Trump, most of those, the majority of two thirds of those people were people that didn't go to church every week. The people who went to every week were more likely to vote for Cruz or Rubio, much different. So that there is a difference between that. Now, another dynamic that's happened in, <coughs> since 2004, you have lost Jerry Falwell, Adrian Rogers, D. James Kennedy, James Dobson is kind of on the wane. And there's a, this been generational wave where the institutional churches, like the Southern Baptist Church, that was the conduit information to the congregation, has been much diminished. Our membership has dropped. And we have more people going to what I call personality churches. You see the rise of Joel Osteen, that you've seen and heard about him. Or, and there's other similar Joel Osteens out there in every city where they, we call them personality churches, where people will go because a person, a pastor. Those churches are very narrow in what they want to do. They talk about the gospel. They talk very little about politics. So the people are used to be informed by the church. That information is not being disseminated. That's another problem that happens. And so you combine that, those two things with people at the, the institutional structure where people had a conduit of getting information and people they would turn to for as, as thoughtful leaders they could be reliable messengers of that thing. And so it's more that everyone's getting their own information, whatever's right to them. And then so you combine that dynamic with the, just the human nature aspect of victimization. Mm -hmm. It's easy for all of us. All of us are equal to say that the reason we're where we are is because we're a victim. It's because Patty did this, and she unfairly got that, or someone else did this. And they're in that position. I should have that. I should have that BMW. I should have that mink coat and that diamond on my ring. It's just that I didn't get the right breaks that they did. It has nothing to do with the work ethic or something they put into to get them there. So it's easy for all of us to default to victimization. And Donald Trump is preying on the victimization. And I would say to, this, to some degree, in my view, the, the left is also doing that thing to, on the other side of saying, you're, you're not there, you are because of victimization. And that's a very dangerous precedent for a civil society. Because if you look at places where that has happened historically, you, become, you start to develop where there's actually civil war and clashes in the street. If we continue down that path <coughs> of this continued division, where you have this continued division and people are you're going to vote for me because that guy over there is taking from you, or vice versa. We're in a very, very dangerous situation as people. So the thing, is, the thing that's, that we're trying to do is to drive people to danger, not just the Republican Party that you're talking about, but our society as a whole, being able to be a, a whole society that, can be, that we can work as a democracy for the things that help everybody. I believe that's the core thing that's more important than anything else. So, we are trying, my group and others like us, 20,000 pastors, are trying to inform people. We're hoping that we can change that dynamic. We believe that we still can, although you're right, the time is very short that. So that's one dynamic. <coughs> the other dynamic that's interesting is, is that there's a civil war within families. I've never seen a situation where we have families voting differently. You may have a family vote four different candidates within a family this year. <coughs> um, we have had pastors that are strong, say, Cruz, Cruz supporters, that their wife, they'll go to the photo booth, and this happened in Alabama, where the head of the Baptist State Convention, his wife voted for Trump. He was aghast, you know? So this, and it goes back to this core thing about this, in, this, and what I call not really entitlement, that's not a bad word, but victimization that people are eating on. And that's, an, that's I think that's a dangerous precedent. So that's part of the things that's going on. It's a unique thing. I want to share one more thing that we noticed in our own data that we were seeing with the, with the information we we're getting from South Carolina. If you look at the week before, the South, as the South Carolina primary was coming for the Republican on Saturday, that whole week, Donald Trump's numbers every day went down. Carl Rove saw it, we saw it. The turning point was the Pope making this comment about the wall. <coughs> he flipped five points in 24 hours. We saw it. We saw it. CNN did a dynamic poll that night, and it was, he was going down and immediately flipped the next day. Cruz and Rubio and all the path made a terrible, terrible mistake in my view. If I was their advisor, I would never have told them. They agreed with Donald Trump. It was the death knell for them in South Carolina. What would have been a better answer would have been something like this. When he's talked about bridges and walls, he says, you know, a lot of people are saying that, that the Pope is talking about walls, a, a wall in Mexico. But you know what? There are walls in our society, and we need to build bridges to things to find solutions. 
what, and we, I feel like I have those solutions that will help benefit all of, of America, not just a small segment of America. If they had said that, it would have changed, in my view, in my view, it would have changed the dynamics of the South Carolina primary. But yeah, I've never seen five percentage points change within 24 hours, and that happened in South Carolina, which propelled him, gave him a wider margin among evangelicals, and ultimately won South Carolina. <coughs> so, same question, and uh, just just briefly before I, uh, I we get to Tom, can he be stopped? I think he can. I mean, I think if you look at the, if we keep him below, he doesn't win. If he doesn't win the 50 percent, he doesn't get the winner take all states. Or if he loses some of those key states, you've got Ohio that has a lot of delegates. You've got Florida that has a lot of delegates. You've got North Carolina. And if this narrative gets out and you start seeing, I'm hoping that we'll actually see departures from a cruise, I mean, excuse me, of Trump delegates. As more of this information, Donald, Donald Trump is more defined. I, I hope and pray that some of these people will start to rethink Donald Trump. And if you see delegates that leave Donald Trump, it won't, it, it'll be the delegate. If the delegates lead the, lead the departure from Donald Trump, it won't have to be the establishment or anybody else that's leading that Trump. That will be the telltale sign. If that doesn't happen, then I think it'll be difficult. If we can do those other things, possibly. Okay. Well, I find and it when you say When you say leave Donald Trump, you mean boycott the convention? I'd say, I'd say they leave and they publicly say they, they, they have made a mistake about Donald Trump. <clears throat> You're talking his delegates. His delegates that are signing, yes. Never been done before. Never been done before. Well, and, and each state is different, right? Because not all the delegates who are technically assigned to Trump are actual Trump supporters. That's, right. That's, That's right. right. That's correct. So, For example, like in right. Alabama, okay, when Alabama, when Huckabee won Alabama in 2008, all the people <clears> that won that delegates, none of those people ended up being delegates. They, right. were, all, they were all party people pick somebody else to, to replace them. There was not a, not a single... Huckabee delegate in 2008 that was on the floor of the state convention that was elected by the people at the ballot. You know, you have your ballot and you have Huckabee and assigned so-and-so's mm -hmm. name. The people that won those slots, not a single one of those, or maybe one, but I don't think, maybe one, maybe, I may be mistaken, but a majority, a large majority of those people were our party people that replaced them at the convention. Okay, so just to play devil's advocate, let's see, <laughs> let's, let's say this happens. Doesn't the Republican Party just implode at that point? I mean, you're negating <laughs> the will of the voters at that point, right? I mean, yes. There's there, just there, a complete. There's been a, there was a many similar thing of instance. I don't know if you remember <clears throat> how much you study Alabama politics. In 1986, the Democratic Party did something like this. There was the Lieutenant Governor Bill Baxley was running for governor, yeah. and the challenger was a, a man named Charlie Graddick who uh, was running against, I think he was Attorney General at the time. Uh, so don't <coughs> that, that's correct. And they ran and, and actually uh, Bill, I um, mean, Charlie Graddock won the vote. But they, the Democrat Party determined that there was too much Republican crossover vote that gave Charlie Graddock the domination. And they wanted Bill Baxley to be the heir to George Wallace at the time. So they gave the nominee to George, Bill Baxley. And Bill Baxley lost terribly to a very well unknown uh, you know, a itinerant preacher by the name of um, Hunt, Guy Hunt, that became governor. And that was the first swing in, of Democrat to Republican back then, even though there was a lot of conservative Democrats back then in Alabama. That was the first swing of when the Republicans actually won an election and led to many more people starting the Republican Party growing in Alabama. All right. Okay. I'm going to switch it up a little bit with Tom. First, let me just say I am addicted to real clear oh, politics. Thank you. I log on multiple times a day. I hit refresh on those I polls. I want to copy this tape afterwards, <laughs> please. I love real clear politics. Um, and, you know, as a, as a political junkie myself, uh, what I found fascinating this cycle, well, I find many things fascinating this cycle, but one of the things is the public po the polls this time around, in contrast to 2012, have been remarkably accurate, aside from some of the caucus states. Um, you know, and God knows Trump loves to cite his polls every chance he gets, but they've been remarkably accurate in my view. What, why do you think that is? Um, and then secondly, I want to shift a little bit to the general. The, the public, and let's just say Hillary Clinton is the nominee for the Democratic side and Donald Trump is the nominee for the Republican side. Right now, polls um, have him beating her. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, I'll take the 
first part first, which is yep. the broader question of polls. <clears throat> you know, pollsters have been, I think, much maligned uh, because their misses are are very uh, you know high profile when they when they miss. But you know, in having done this for for 20 years and watched pollsters adapt to a really changing you know dramatically changing landscape of people not having any landlines anymore um, you know all of all of those things that they've had to deal with uh, I think they've done a pretty good job now we've certainly had instances where pollsters you know some people even turned out to be fraudulent they were making up numbers you have that kind of stuff but that's one of the not to be a salesman about the the average but <clears throat> that's one of the t useful uh, tools that that the real clear politics average provides which is you know a mashup of four or five polls uh, from a contemporaneous period in time, which smooths out any idiosyncrasies. You know, for example, one, one example, <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal, NBC News Wall Street Journal came out with a poll, very well-respected pollster, uh, came out with a national poll showing Ted Cruz ahead of Donald Trump by two points, 28 to 26. And the media lost its collective mind, <laughs> right? And uh -huh. all the anti-Trump folks went nuts. Donald, uh, um, Ted Cruz got up there and said, there's a new national front runner on the scene, ladies and gentlemen, and it's me. Well, you know, actually that's not the case. In the, in the 30 national polls that have been taken in, in the previous 90 days, Donald Trump had led in 29 of them. And in 25 of those polls, he led by double digits. So the polling actually had been pretty consistent all along. Um, we, we have had a couple of high profile misses. You will undoubtedly remember <laughs> New Hampshire in 2008. Uh, Barack Obama came storming out of Iowa, uh, and all the polls said he was going to win that state by eight or nine points, and there was a pretty dramatic shift toward Hillary Clinton, which pollsters didn't capture because they weren't in the field for the final 24, 36 hours. They stopped polling uh, before the weekend, and so they didn't catch it. It happened uh, in Iowa this cycle, too, right. predicting Trump. It did, it did happen in Iowa. Actually, there were a couple late polls that showed the, that showed the caucus really close. Mm -hmm. um, so the trend was there. You can go back and look at our average. You'll see the trend lines. Uh, were there, but uh, even, you know, Ann Selzer, the Des Moines Register, she's, right. you know, considered the gold standard, had Trump winning by five, and he lost by, I think, about that amount. So, um, but I agree with you. The polls, I think, by and large, have been pretty good and pretty solid, and, um, you know, that's one of the things uh, that uh, it just, I, I went back and actually looked at the averages, because I had heard a lot of this talk today, too, that Trump had collapsed in the in the final, you know, 24, 36 hours because of this David Duke KKK thing. Actually, if you go back and look at, at the at the averages, um, he was pretty much on in almost every state. The only state where he underperformed pretty significantly was Oklahoma. He uh -huh. was up double digits there, ended up losing that state. And in Virginia, where he had a, a 15 point lead at 14 and a half, and ended up you know winning by just a couple. So um, and that actually wasn't because he fell down; it was because Rubio, Rubio surged. Right. So. Um, as far as the general elect as general election is concerned, we I just looked at it before I came down here because, <clears throat> excuse me, Donald Trump says repeatedly, often, <laughs> very confidently that he's beating Hillary Clinton in a general election. It's not true. There are four polls. That's, that's so weird that he said something that's not true. Yeah, that's right. right. It's Shocking. It's so weird that he's Shocking. talking not, about polls. It's not like what you would think with Donald Trump. Right. Anyway. Four polls, uh, general election matchup polls have been taken in. in in the month of February, Trump is leading in one of them. Um, he's losing in the other three, and on average, he loses to Hillary Clinton by about, uh, th I think, three percentage points. She's at 46, he's at 43. Um, so, and the other two candidates, Cruz is actually beating Clinton by, I think, a point, and Rubio's up by about five. So, clearly, um, you know, Rubio is the best general election candidate as of right now, given the data that we have, and Trump is the, is the weakest. Something else too about the numbers in, in the state Super Tuesday you haven't talked about. No one has asked. I haven't heard at least people or media hadn't called me and asked me this: is why did why did Cruz do? We understand why he did well in Texas, but why did he do better in Oklahoma as you referred to? Why did he do almost caught <coughs> up in Arkansas? And there's a reason. I believe there's a reason for that. If you look, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, but if you look at where the the incubators, I will, if you will, of where emails come out of, where there's, where there's family focus, people that get information, informational gatherers. They're concentrated in Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas. Family Life Ministries is, is based in Little Rock, all these mm -hmm. people. They think Trump is an, an anthem. 
Okay? So it gives me hope that they're going to be the first people, the purveyor of this information on Trump, when people finally get, came out of their, their slumber and start purveying this information. I looked at those numbers and I thought, hmm, there's something more to these numbers, why he's doing well in these little states. Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, they don't have those, those local institutions that have natural re national reach. Now, that may end up being nothing in the end of the day, but I think there's something to that because these people that have local influence, that have natural reach, they're going to the ones, when they have natural reach, they're going to be in get bringing in this information, okay? And they're going to be disseminating it. Some of that's going to spill out into the local, local election. And I've seen that before. So I find that's interesting. So I now project that to, say, Missouri, for example, where Eagle Forum is very strong. And they have a very, very anti-Trump thing where Phyllis Schlafly is based in St. Louis. Will that have an influence on evangelicals in, in Missouri? Other places like Ohio, same thing. In Ohio, there's a tremendous number of evangelical ministries in Ohio, for example. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see if, if this national movement, if you will, of this anti-Trump thing that people <coughs> finally woke up to, as it, as it filters out through the community, will it have an effect in some of these states where these people have strong local, not only national influence by bringing information in, but disseminate it locally? Can I just add one sure. thing? <clears throat> Another alternate theory, and it might, might play off of that to a certain degree, which is uh, the places where Donald Trump lost last night uh, were closed yeah, caucuses absolutely. and primaries. Mm -hmm. He lost in Minnesota, it was a closed mm -hmm. caucus. He lost in Alaska, closed caucus. He lost in Oklahoma, closed primary. Um, he lost in Iowa, closed caucus. Yeah. The, only where he, the only place he's won in a closed caucus was Nevada, and he, and he dominated. So that, you know, it's not just positive, but it could be the exceptional rule. A lot of people think that they have a chance of slowing down Trump in this period now, this two-week period before the winner-take-all states, because you have, uh, on March 5th, you've got Kansas, Kentucky, and Maine, all closed caucuses. Hawaii is a closed caucus on the 8th. Um, Louisiana is a closed primary. Idaho and Michigan are closed primaries. So <clears throat> it could be the fact that when, you, when you're able to narrow it down to registered Republican voters, that Trump doesn't do as well. At least that's the hope. And that certainly is the hope for Marco Rubio because Florida is a closed primary as well. Right. And it's winner take all 99 It really depends right. though on the state. Each state has different rules about how late you can register right. Right. as a Republican to go then join the Republican primary. Because uh, in a lot of the states, Trump, has, you've seen a huge surge in last minute Republican registrations. <clears throat> Those people tend to break for Trump. They're, they're people Trump is bringing into the process. So it, in the states where that's harder to do, where there needs to be a bigger peer, wait peer, period in between uh, when you register and when you can vote, the Trump might not do as well. That's one. Well, point. That's okay. One other dynamic, too, is interesting that we haven't talked about is that if there, there was this fear of Trump is the nominee, what will happen to these other Senate races, for example? Right. Well, that's if the, a big if the primary is any indicator of that, that really doesn't transmit because I, I think I thought it was crazy. I'm looking, here's Trump at 40 something percent in Alabama. Yet every, you'd think, that, okay, well, let's throw all the bums out. Shelby wins by 70 percent. Mike Rogers wins by 70 percent. Martha Roby wins by 70 percent. And people, these were people that had F grades by red state and all these people, conservative view, F, F, yeah. F, 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 least effective congressman. The problem was is those people couldn't get their message out because they're drowned by Donald Trump, Trump every day. So, but, but to that point, the question that interests to me would be, as this fear is about, well, gosh, if Trump says we lose the Senate, the Republican, is the, is the primary an indicator of that if it doesn't translate, or will it do different in the general election? Who knows? We don't know that yet. Right. Okay. So uh, consensus then is he is so stoppable, but this, it's a very slim chance. It's a long shot. It's a long shot. Yeah. And it depends on how much people, <laughs> how much the party establishment and conservatives and whoever, I mean, who are the anti-Trump wings, how much they're willing to put on the line. Right. I mean, Okay, so let's talk about the Democrats a little bit. And uh, I think that falls on me because <laughs> it falls on me. Uh, Hillary had a good night last night, too. She won seven states and a territory. Uh, uh, she won the South by large, large margins. Uh, and uh, she, but she won Massachusetts, which I think, though, is even more important than winning the South, which she was expected to do because <coughs> of the minority vote there. Uh, she won in a white liberal state uh, that was in um, 
the backyard of New Hampshire where uh, Bernie Sanders kind of blew her out um, a few weeks ago. So um, while I think Bernie Sanders has won a fantastic campaign, I mean, this is a guy who was nowhere eight months ago, uh, and he has raised an extraordinary amount of money, $41 million in the month of February alone. He has resonated uh, with, uh, I like to call it that sort of flip of the coin on the Democratic side of that anger and frustration with uh, Washington um, and institutions and establishments. Uh, and what I think he has been most successful in doing is really uh, dominating the conversation on the Democratic side and forcing Hillary Clinton to go left uh, on issues that she hadn't foreseen that she was going to have to go left on. Um, having said all of that, I think, uh, and Tom, I want to get your view on this, uh, the, it, it's a very difficult path for Bernie Sanders moving forward. I mean, the math, the primary calendar and the delegate math is just not there for him. Um, next states up are Michigan and Mississippi. I think it's pretty clear that Hillary's going to win Mississippi. Uh, uh, and Michigan, she sort of put a stake in the ground with Flint. Uh, and Bern while Bernie thinks he has a fighting chance there. He's putting a lot of money in there. I just don't know if it's going to be enough with the with the trade issue. Um, so in my view, I think Hillary is going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party. I think, though, her challenge right now is uh, pivoting from a primary election to a general election and having Donald Trump or another Republican in her sights, but without ignoring Bernie Sanders, hmm, without <laughs> ignoring Bernie Sanders, <coughs> because ignoring Bernie Sanders will alienate his supporters. Uh, and he has said he's going to stay in this race. He has the money to compete. Uh, there's no reason for him not to continue to be in this race. Hillary Clinton stayed in the race until June in 2008. She doesn't have a leg to stand on to say, you got to get out. Uh, um, so, Tom, yeah. do you think Hillary Clinton is going to be the nominee? Of course. Of course. I mean, <laughs> look, to simplify, you cannot win the Democratic nomination for, for president without winning minority voters. I mean, right. she's dominating. I mean, 80 plus percent of African Americans across the South uh, yesterday. I mean, that's just that math. And makes Hispanics it, in Texas. And Hispanics in Texas. I mean, so, so the math just doesn't work for Bernie Sanders. I mean, he won his states. That's fine. But it's, it's you know, at this point, it's kind of water under the bridge. I think she's... My, my question <clears throat> is, do the young voters who have worked so hard for Sanders and who have pretty uh, firmly mm -hmm. rejected Clinton... Do they show up on a? I mean, I, I don't think the Republicans have a great chance of poaching many of them, but do they show up on in November? What do you think, and what do you think? I mean, both, either of you. Well, look, I, I think, like I said, Hillary's challenge is going to be to unify this party and bring those young people yeah. along. Uh, once we get to the convention and once she is the nominee, you're going to have... Barack Obama on the campaign trail, and uh, he reaches, he resonates with that demographic. Uh, and I believe, notwithstanding this slim chance to stop him, I believe Donald Trump is going to be the right. nominee. That's actually and her I, biggest hope. And <laughs> that is a huge motivator yeah, for right. for every demographic in the Democratic Party. So I, I think they'll come out. I, I think, let me share something else with you. I think is very, very interesting, and you'll probably think this sounds very strange from a uh, Republican, conservative, evangelical. I think what the Democrat Party has done very, very well is to frame what I call eight to five issues. You know, saying that, and, and where Republicans have been, even though these are things I believe in, some of these social issues that are very, very strong, 
the amount of time and energy that's spent on Iowa, think about it in Iowa just for a second. We had huge bloggers that were tearing people apart over nuances <coughs> of social issues, I mean, on the, the microscopic things of social issues that took all the oxygen out of the room. So you had people tacking way over there to this position. Uh -huh. And I'm sitting here thinking as a doctor, you know, I'm thinking, I see people all walks of life, see Democrats, Republicans, when they come to my office, I don't ask them. They don't ask me what I, what I believe or my politics or anything, except for some of the people that know I'm politically active and they just do it for fun. But I treat people the same no matter who they are. And they all have issues. They're all dealing with people that maybe are drug addicted or have someone in their family that's <coughs> on drugs. They have family members that have been sexually assaulted on campus. I had, a, I had an African-American woman that was 52 years old this week come into my office. And she was in tears in my office because she said, Dr. Brinson, I appreciate you caring about me. And she started telling me her story. You know what her story was? Her mother would not talk to her until seven years ago at age 45 because her mother finally told her that she was a victim of rape and was conceived in rape. And that every time she <coughs> saw her, daughter that she was reminded of the rapist and it tore her and she was in tears and I had empathy with these people I've had people say what you're telling me Dr. Renson inspires me that people don't believe anything when I believe politically <coughs> so to the credit of the Democratic Party they have touched those chords I have to give them credit if the Republican Party wants to be to build more people they're gonna have to talk about those issues more pertinently <coughs> Joe Biden at the Academy Award talks about it's on us. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard a single Republican candidate talk about sexual assault. So these are things that we have had that I see from a medical standpoint that has tremendous repercussions in people at 85. We have to, we, when I say we, if I would describe myself as a Republican, we have to talk about them more and we have to include these people and that has to be part of the dialogue. And it's biblically based. If you, if you believe the Bible as I do, these things are biblically based. So. I say that to say this is that these are things that are important to people. We all need to be talked about, and we need to be not dividing people. We need to start bringing people together instead of our grievances and everything. Let's talk about how we can help people because we all have, have been gifted. And if we can invest ourselves in each of us can be, to invest in one family's life, taking advantage, each of you, if you leave today, say, I'm going to invest in one person's life because of, of, the, of the things that I've been given, I think you'll be rewarded and you'll be very uplifted. Can I just add one thing? Yeah, and then we've got to go to <clears throat> questions in the audience. Okay. One of the big questions heading into this election was, was Barack Obama's coalition durable and transferable, right? Uh -huh. <clears throat> would whoever the Democratic nominee was going to be, would that person be able to generate the same level of turnout and intensity among, you know, his coalition? The early signs are good for Hillary Clinton. She's doing right. it with African Americans. She's doing it with Hispanics. The young voters are sort of the missing piece, yeah. right? Um, but... The early signs are good. It, it looks like it is happening for her. And then the question is, the other thing, though, is like the turnout numbers. There is, there's record turnout on the Republican side, in part because they had so many candidates, and it's a total dumpster fire brawl, right. street brawl. Uh, and Democratic levels are down. I think that has to worry Democrats that in a general election setting, maybe they're not going to get the intensity that they need among those groups to, you know, because Obama was so good at that and was able to do it in 2012, even despite all of the metrics that told us he shouldn't be able to do it. High unemployment, uh, low job approval rating, I mean, all the normal metrics that right. we pundits use to sort of gauge how a president's going to do in re-election, he should have lost, and he didn't. And so um, it'll be interesting to see when, like when we get to a general election setting, whether whether she's able to do that or not. I like dumpster fire street yeah. brawl as a description of that's so, the name of my next <clears throat> book. Yeah. Year. Okay, <laughs> questions from the audience. Who do we got? I think who's I'm not picking them. C Citizens United was based on Hillary the movie. So what I wonder is why citizens don't simply pool money uh, regardless of which candidate they prefer to invest a lot of money in making a movie that would be titled something like Dictator Trump, <laughs> which would be a cross between Citizen Kane showing all of uh, Trump's many uh, like uh, frauds and uh, especially Trump University and uh, a marvelous movie, Emperor Jones, which uh, shows uh, a, kind of 
con man becoming dictator of a banana republic. And so with the right amount of money and showmanship, one could present a performance that would be a parody, although a lot of it would be based just on quoting Trump, that uh, could be very entertaining and also could uh, really eviscerate Trump, uh, hitting a lot of the foundations of his support. But my question is, why don't people who uh, think Trump would be a disgrace to America rather than make America great uh, simply do this? You could, you could start it here. Who wants to donate? <laughs> <laughs> what about Act, actually, actually, that's in the process not very far from here in Chicago. That is in Do the process. Tell. And the incubator is right here. Isn't it interesting? Barack Obama's thing, the incubator for this is right here in, near Chicago. Uh, it's called, we're going to say, No to President Porno. Uh, <laughs> it has a big badge. It has an X in it. It has... President Porno, no. And if it all goes well, we'll have a bus going around with, and you can sign your name to it with all the different groups that are supporting it. And you sign, you go by and you sign your name to it, and we have a lot of different people. So you stole my thunder. He, you, he did. I, I will say, though. In fact, I may put him on the bus with him. What do you think? <laughs> you should, yeah, yeah, do it. I think what he's getting at, though, is actually something interesting that we've seen a lot of like columnists and commentators talking about recently. I don't know how big of a movement it actually could possibly turn into. But there are a lot of people have argued that uh, Trump is such a, uh, people on the left, that Trump is such a menace, that he would be so bad for the country, that uh, you know him winning the Republican nomination and he even having some sliver of a chance of becoming president is frightening enough that people should switch over to switch their party <laughs> registrations and vote against Trump in the Republican primary just to ensure that that doesn't happen. I think that that's a, a long shot in terms of actually getting you know, to a, a groundswell big enough for that to happen. But it does show the level of uh, anxiety about a Trump presidency that a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people have. Uh, and I have to say, as somebody who has uh, been on the receiving end of a Trump uh, flame war, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I understand the sentiment. Yeah. In fact, it'll be very interesting. Uh, Weg, Mitten, Weg Mitt Whitman, excuse me, Weg Meg Whitman, Meg Whitman. Oh, I can't talk who uh, was the, the money behind uh, Chris Christie. She is so disgusted. There's, there's word that she is talking to people like Oprah Winfrey to get everyone on the same page. Wow. And if Oprah Winfrey and Meg Whitman get on the same page just on this one issue, that would be pretty remarkable. All right. Next question. <coughs> How about the student over there? Yeah. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, what do you think the effects of a large-scale, organized, super pac backed um, advertisement campaign against Trump will be? Do you think those attacks will work, or will they just confirm the idea that he's uh, being uh, targeted by the establishment, and will it drive more people to support him? Uh, uh, go ahead. No, no. Um, I think it'll work. It, we, we don't know because there has been no sustained this is, I know, effort this is <laughs> with resources <laughs> to attack him or to even to uh, unveil who he really is. There has been no sustained effort. So um, all of these fantastic, do them. I mean, but no one is stepping up. I, no, no, but, no one is but, but Patty, doing here's, here's, it. And, it, and it should have been done. Six this is okay. Ago. I've done a lot. It this been is done the six thing. Ago. So there was always this notion, and I've done a lot of reporting on this. That before, that for like months and months, when Trump was leading in the polls last year, there was this idea that you know, there's, he'll flame out. He's a joke, whatever. And the worst case scenario is that we'll get we'll get like a couple months out from Iowa, and if he's still leading in the polls, this huge you know, concerted effort on the right, right. will come together with super PACs and, you know, opposing presidential campaigns, and they will carpet bomb the early primary states with negative ads about Trump exposing him, and that, that'll do the trick, right? Because there's so much fodder. Mm -hmm. And there is, I mean, there is, the, the fodder is there. There's plenty there. That, the anti-Trump cavalry is decided to start turning into gear like this week. Mm -hmm. right. Which that's is right. insane if you that's think insane. about it. But that, that's mm -hmm. where we are. And so right. it, it is possible that it could have a big effect. I actually do think that there is no human being on earth who 
can withstand $100 million in negative ads right. without at least having his, the public perception of him seriously changed. But it might be too late. It's too I mean, late. <clears throat> well, there's, there's two things, two caveats to that. And for example, my company, the way I work is our, our consulting company, we do work for everything from the American Cancer Society, stop smoking campaigns, to political campaigns. So when you're talking about emails under the can spam law, I can send emails to you if I'm double op-ended. I have 130 million emails in the United States. It's kind of scary. I can go to a street in Chicago. I can tell you how much you, how much you owe on your mortgage. I can tell you what, where you work. I can do all this stuff because all this information is, is pretty, not everybody, but I'm just saying there's a lot, of, a lot of information. I can tell you what magazines you read. So can uh, President Obama. That's why he. That's why he became president. <coughs> Nobody reads magazines. Anymore. Well, I know. Whatever. Or whatever. Whatever. Whatever things. Can you advertise like. on Buzzfeed. On Buzzfeed. <laughs> yeah. All, all this information. <laughs> but the problem has been on the right is that mostly <coughs> most of these groups are C3s. You know, that's the problem. So they're afraid they'll lose attack. They can't electioneer. Mm -hmm. So concerned women of America, Susan B. Anthony list, pro life, national right to life, all these groups are most of them are C3, some are C4, so they don't technically electioneer. And then you have the people that could do that, but now that money is all moved in super PACs because they have want to control the message. And these people who run the super PACs have the money because of the money, the connection to the Koch brothers or whoever their, their funder du jour is. But they may not know what the grassroots really wants to hear. And that's where the disconnect is. So there's all this, it's like, it's like, having, it's like having an attack, if you imagine you've got your troops massed and you're going to assault this, this fortress, right? Well, there's all these little pinpricks, and there's not a consolidated assault. So what happens there? you have the pinprick, the other side just choo, choo. And so there has to be a concerted effort, everybody on the same page trying to, with a concerted message, re redoes it. Now, the second thing that's very important, in political campaigns, if you want someone to win, especially when you're behind the eight ball, you create what we call an echo chamber. So you, you, put, it, you put something out, the Washington Post picks it up, and then they rebroadcast what the Washington Post said. And then another, another surrogate says this. And then they get, it, they get message in the New York Times. And they say, well, the New York Times says this. And you create an echo chamber. And so it's like, oh my gosh, everybody in the world is saying this about this guy. But if it's just one super PAC saying one message and the media doesn't create the echo chamber, it makes it less effective too. So those are two things I've just learned just, about trying to get <clears> the data done. Can I just add, I'm going to be a contrarian here. I don't think it's going to work. I think you've had. 15 debates that have been watched by tens of millions, hundreds of millions, if you add up the cum, right, of Republican voters, highest ratings ever. Uh, these guys have spent money against Trump. It hasn't been coordinated, it hasn't, but groups have spent money against Trump. The problem is not, Trump has 30 to 35% of the Republican electorate that are locked in. They're not going anywhere. They don't, you could tell them that, you know, he robbed the store down, and like he said, he could shoot someone on, you know, Fifth Avenue. They're not going away. The problem is that the field is too fractured. And unless and until some of these guys get out and that anti-Trump vote can coalesce behind Rubio or Cruz or whomever, right? You can spend all the money on Trump you want. I don't know that it's gonna drive his numbers down. Um, it might keep them where they are, might, might not allow him to uh, you know, raise his ceiling any, but. But don't you think though that, and well, I'll let another question. Just, but <coughs> my only thing with, I, I, I get what you're saying and he has defined himself pretty well by now. There are, he's bringing people into the process who don't typically vote in Republican right, primaries right, right now. Right. There are a lot of P Trump supporters who are like that. A savagely negative, and I'm not saying this is like necessarily the most hope-inducing thing, but a savagely negative, mm -hmm. extremely well-funded campaign against him might not necessarily turn Trump's voters into Rubio voters, but you could see a lot of Trump voters be so turned off by the whole thing that they just don't show up. Right. You don't agree? You don't think that's possible? I, I, I mean, also, maybe it's possible. It hasn't happened yet. Too, too bad <laughs> nobody like tried well, testing this theory six and months also ago. And also the thing right? that's really important that everybody takes away from this stuff, the Republican Party is not Donald Trump. If you right. look at Boil It Down, you're talking a, a 10% of the whole electorate. You're talking about only 10% of this hardcore people. These things were the same hardcore people that had these very, very harsh views um, that the, it was feeding. They were always there. There's always this minority of people that have these very harsh views that make their home in the Republican Party. We're not proud of them. I'm not proud of them as, as someone <coughs> aligned somewhat with the Republican Party, not always. But we're not proud of them. So, but it's very small, just like Massachusetts. It got 49% of the vote. But of what? You know, how, much, how many Republicans are in Massachusetts? So you have right. to look at those numbers like in that view, too. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Oh, wait, I'm sorry, him, the, the student here. 
Yeah? Uh, well, uh, maybe I'm a little bit biased because I'm anti-Trump. And I've written so much and thinking so much about what's going wrong with him. But now I start to think more about what's going wrong with his voters. Uh, I'm thinking about <coughs> the, uh, the political culture in the United States. I believe that in this election, the pain is more about the addition rather than the subtraction. I think it's the duel between the new class of voters for Trump as opposed to those people who, for whatever reason, dislike him. So I think he's writing high on popular culture and um, there's a deep-seated uh, reason which I believe is the anti-intellectualism in the United States uh -huh. because there are so many facts that's going around with Trump, uh, including the immigration issue. So my, 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 my question is, uh, for these unprecedented turnout rate on the Republican side, is that primarily about Trump's appeal? And if that correlation is high, is it an indication of mob rule? An indication of? Mob rule. Mob rule. Yeah. <coughs> Who wants to take it? Um, well, uh, well, the only thing I'll say about that is that the Republican Party establishment does have does share some blame in the rise of Trump for a lot of reasons. And one of them is that the people who are flocking to Trump are generally disenfra feel disenfranchised, feel ignored by the political establishment, by the Republican Party. A lot of them are uh, white working class men, women. Uh, pe a lot of them, frankly, are pe maybe not weekly churchgoers, but people of faith who feel like the Republican Party is constantly ridiculing them, the political class is ridiculing their beliefs on social issues. Um, the, a lot of people are, uh, have been, feel like they've lost their jobs because of uh, uh, illegal immigration. They feel the, you know, the, the economic anxiety of a very slow recovery. And frankly, the Republican Party has, for too long now, I think, been the party of the job creators. Um, Mitt Romney's entire stump speech, I covered Mitt Romney in 2012, was about how we need to champion the job creators, champion the small businessmen. That's great, but the majority of this country is not small businessmen, and the people who are going to vote for Trump are the people who have been laid off by small businessmen. And the, the Republican Party has not done enough to reach out to those people to make them feel like they're part of the process, make them feel like they're, uh, they're appreciated and listened to. Uh, the last thing I'll say is Trump, I was, in Nevada when he won that night, he said something that a lot of people in the political class made fun of. He was going through all the demographics he had won and he said, you know, I won the, the, uh, we, I won the poorly educated. I love the poorly educated. <laughs> a lot of people made, made jokes about that and, and, you know, and said, oh, look, he's basically admitting that he's conning the, the ignorant. But I mean, look, like the, the <clears throat> fact that we can all sit here or on cable news or whatever and make fun of that, but a lot of people are not college graduates and they feel like the political class has left them behind and is making fun of them and mocking them. And Donald Trump talks to them like they're important, like he, like they, like he cares about them. I personally think he is conning them, but he, is taught, he makes them feel like they're more important than fundraisers and pundits. And until the Republican Party, the rest of the Republican Party can figure that out, that the, there's going to continue to be Trump-like insurgency. Well, and, and it's reinforced by, like I said, in Alabama, where you have the Business Council of Alabama running, running candidates or funding candidates that the grassroots doesn't like. And the grassroots <coughs> candidates can't hit there, they can't see anything. But on an even more, ma on a more basic level, people are, people, if you talk to people in the South, for example, and maybe, you know, I, I just, because that's what I'm familiar with, that's where I'm from, the South, they get upset when they see the guy that was arrested go to the Publix grocery store and, he, and he, you, they know he was arrested, they saw on TV he was arrested, he got on bond, he's going to the public store and he's buying crab legs and filet mignons with an EBD card. They, 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 that, that is an anthem to them. You know, that is an anthem to their, they go by and they're afraid that they, they've got a Section 8 house that's got granite countertops and stuff, they're living better than they do. There's people in the South that, that uh, with their, they're on entitlement and they feel like they're quote, on the dole, okay? Rightly or wrongly, it's a stereotype. They see these people, they say, on the dole, and they're getting more, making more money and benefits than they are that working and making 30000 a year. The policeman's making 30000 a year. The school teacher's making 40000 a year. They're better off, these people, that are not giving anything 
and it's and it's become it's become almost like a widespread. So these are things that people see, and they're seeing these images, and they, they associate Donald Trump with the savior. They're going to stop all this. Whether he doesn't <laughs> even talk about it, but they see that association. And as as he said, it's it's these people that don't understand enough how the dynamics of government works. They're new to the system. They just say this guy's going to change things when they don't understand the nuances of what it really takes to take change. So yes, but I do, I do worry about what's going to happen long term between <coughs> these clashes of, of ideas and, and people and, and the animosity that's raised by it. Tom, do you want to say something? Yeah, quickly. Um, I think it's important to keep sort of this in perspective, and Patty mentioned this earlier, that this is not a phenomenon that is just sort of relegated to Donald Trump. We're right. seeing the same thing on the other side. It's, right. the, it's two sides of the same coin, right. right? The angst and anxiety on the right is they look at Washington, they think it's crony capitalism, right? The big government, big business have conspired to stick it to the little guy. On the left, it's the evil one percenters on Wall Street have rigged the system against you. Um, I went and saw Bernie Sanders in, in Mason City, Iowa before, the, before the, um, the Iowa caucuses, and I hadn't seen him live before. I hadn't seen a full stump speech. I'd only seen the snippets that I got on the TV. And, and this is truly the year of the demagogue. Bernie Sanders is every bit, Donald Trump is rightly castigated, okay, for scapegoating Mexicans and Muslims and all that. But Bernie Sanders, if you listen to him on the stump, it's amazing. He is telling people that, I mean, he is not just vilifying industries, he's naming names. He says the reason that you guys are so upset is because the Walton family won't pay their employees $15 an hour. It's because the head of Goldman Sachs is screwing you. I mean, he is naming names. And so, and, and if you look at Bernie Sanders' poll, he's getting 35%. Donald Trump's getting 35 percent. The only difference is Bernie Sanders is in a two-person race. Donald Trump was in a 17-person race. Okay, so I, I, the phenomenon that's going on is much more sort of dynamic and complicated than just saying these people are all anti-intellectual rubes who are being conned or whatever. Um, and it's much more widespread. I think right. we really are seeing this is a really interesting and important and I think pivotal moment in American politics. That's a really I good agree. point. Okay, I, I, pro I promised yeah. her. <laughs> And then we'll go back over there. Sorry. I've got a few things to say, but I'm going to try to make it as brief as possible. I think conservative radio created the narrative for Donald Trump. I mean, they created him for many years. It just has metastasized now to this political cycle. But if you go back to when Barack Obama ran, I mean, Donald Trump really created the narrative along with Palin in terms of him not being, and actually Hillary provided him <coughs> some talking points as well, with him being a foreign born and that he was not really an American. I mean, all those things have been seeping through the political stream for the last, really the last eight years, if not more. And then you have a conservative radio host who in many ways actually supported uh, Donald Trump. I listen to um, conservative radio on a regular basis, and they actually make a lot of excuses for him. It's that political red meat that people are really actually, they want that political unrest. They want to go out there and, you know, turn things up. And I think with Donald Trump, whether you believe what he's saying or not, he's consistent with his message, is clear, and it doesn't have all the political finesse. Anybody can, it's very palatable, and to be honest with you, even though I don't support him anyway, I think he's, he's giving us that unicorn kind of politics. In a way, so does uh, Bernie Sanders. I love Bernie, though. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's that very high level kind of don't you wish rainbows with skills in the sky, and you know it's not, a it's not a monarchy. It's not one where somebody can just say, this is what I want, and it will, the streets will be painted with gold. But I think because you have that sense of deep-seated unrest, from an African-American perspective, I'm actually kind of surprised Hillary is getting such high numbers. And I don't know if, if you guys have done any split in terms of if it's an older, more you know, uh, group that's voting for her, because the younger generation actually in many ways kind of support what Donald Trump is saying with regards to foreigners coming in, taking jobs from people who basically want those jobs that for, long, for so long people have said, oh, they don't, you, don't, you don't want these kind of jobs. Well, when you see everybody hanging on the corner on the south side of Chicago, a lot of black uh, African-American males who are basically, they don't have jobs, right? There's a high incarceration rate that actually President Clinton contributed to that. Also, his NAFTA agreement <coughs> did nothing for America. So pretty much her platform, along with her husband, has done very little, if any, 
to progress the African American community. Now, it does seem like she's a little bit more sympathetic, and perhaps maybe she's being a little bit more progressive, and she has to take on uh, the legacy of our, of our current president. Yeah, but I just, I don't think, I think that if, if Trump continues on being a little, just pull back a little bit with the, you know, the, the, with the, the racism rhetoric, and stuff. I think he would get some African Americans <clears throat> that would more than likely kind of participate in some of his uh, theatrical rhetoric. I, I will say, uh, just sort of more broadly speaking, I mean, Tavis Smiley had a piece in USA Today saying, hey, you know, don't be so sure that African Americans aren't going to jump on the Trump train. Um, I, this idea that, that Donald Trump is um, going to be a total disaster debacle for the Republicans and they're going to lose all these Senate seats and all these House seats and all these governorships because it's possible. It's also, you know, could be the opposite because for the exact reason that we've been talking about, he's bringing new people into the process. Um, and if he gets in a general election, against a candidate who has massive flaws of her own. That's what I was about um, to say. Yeah. You know, and we were just talking about today, they're already at like 45%, and imagine six months of them beating each other up and all the money. I mean, they will probably be the two most have the, unpopular, yeah, most right. unpopular, <laughs> pop, popular, unlikable right. candidates. I, but I, so to your point, I think that um, anybody who thinks they know what's going to happen, if this election cycle has taught us anything, it's that we don't know, and we shouldn't assume things. Yes. Um, I was just talking to someone today. Ben Carson's out. OK. Well, I've heard people say, well, that means, you know, those voters are automatically going to Ted Cruz. That's going to help Ted. Not necessarily. Donald Trump's doing fine with evangelicals. Mar Marco Rubio's doing well with evangelicals. So I, I just. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I so echo. I mean, I totally hear you. I worked for Hillary Clinton for 17 years. And I'm nervous about running against Donald Trump for her. I, I'm very nervous. This is, a, this is a, an election cycle where. The electorate is just pissed off mm -hmm. at institutions, at Washington, at politicians, at the media, and there is she embodies a lot. She of that. embodies of much of it. Uh, so, and I can't even begin to get into the sort of the volatility of again these two candidates who are wildly unpopular with the other side. Uh, it's going to get ugly. It's going to get, it's, it's going to be vitriolic <laughs> on many exactly. levels. And, uh, you know, I don't know how she fares in that kind of fight, honestly. The fact that he's going to turn out more voters might actually make him the best Republican candidate. Um, and then also, I think it's sort of overhyped how bad Ted Cruz did on like Super Tuesday compared to Trump. He only got 27 less delegates. Is that actually that bad for him? Do you need to win more? Um, on the second question about Cruz, you're right. Cruz you actually. That question, by the way. No. Okay. Um, oh, I, I want to talk through the second part of the question. It had to do with, um, you know, the narrative was that, that Super Tuesday wasn't great for Ted Cruz, but yet the actual delegate differential wasn't that significant. Did he actually have a better night? And the first part of the question was? The Trump in a general election. Whether Trump, Trump would be able to people. actually be a good general election oh, candidate because yeah, he'll bring in a lot of new voters. Well, we just heard Patty Solis Doyle say <laughs> that she's nervous about Hillary Clinton running against Trump. So somebody tweet that, and I'll retweet it after. Oh, that. no, no, uh, don't tweet it after. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what else? What, on, on the second question, I, I will say it's true that uh, Cruz did do better than the most recent expectations for him. Um, also, you know, I said at the beginning of this that Trump underperformed. Cruz also had his home state uh, yesterday, which is a huge, he's not going to have that again. Right. He, uh, it was also a lot of southern states right. where he was best suited for the electorate there. Um, and in the primaries going forward, they're not nearly as conducive to, to, uh, to Cruz victories. Um, so, but, but yes, you're, I, I think you're right. I think that uh, the, reading the headlines and the, the cable news chyrons about last night about, you know, huge night for Trump. Trump had a good night. He didn't have, the, he didn't sweep this, you know, Super Tuesday. And I think that we should keep that in check here as we're talking about what's going on. Yeah, and I think the other narrative that you haven't seen is we're ta you're talking about a snapshot right now in time. You have no idea, you have no idea how much conservative evangelical Christians between now and the, and, the, and Cleveland, there may be pickets in Cleveland 
I'm telling you, that's how much, how much angst and stuff, and what that is going to take a toll on Trump. And that, will, that could roll over in the general election. So th again, there's all these unknowns. But I can tell you personally, personally, there will be a war with Donald Trump for the next several months between now and Cleveland. And that makes Patty happy. <laughs> and that makes her happy. Very happy. <laughs> a little less a, nervous. An implosion on the Republican <laughs> Party is good for us. Yeah. It's good for us. I have a couple of program notes, but before I get to those really quickly, please join me in thanking Kay Coppin, Mary Benson, Tom Levin, and new book is for sale out in the lobby by our partner's uh, sem seminary called Bookstore, and Kay has kindly agreed to sign copies of that, so we encourage you, if you're interested in picking up a copy, to do so here in a few minutes. I also wanted to mention that our partners, the Center for Policy Entrepreneurship at Harris, who are hosting Randy Brinson um, today and tomorrow, will be hosting a lunch with him, and anybody here who is interested in continuing the conversation over lunch uh, is invited to do so. Um, our colleague, Mark Farinella, who runs the Center for Policy Entrepreneurship, is back in the corner, and you can uh, see him if you're interested in attending lunch tomorrow. And with that, I want to thank all of you for being here. We hope you have a great evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks.